Yelling. No, I didn't just tell you to put away the shotgun so you could take the shotgun back out. Get the peps gun. to the RPG Fan Podcast. I'm your host, Robert. God, if I had to do that voice the whole time, that would just be terrible. Anywho, uh, welcome to Random Encounter, the RPG Fan Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Steinman, Pale Robbie on the boards. Joining me today, we have the illustrious return of the pin chick. Hi, I'm Zach. Uh, I write news occasionally, not recently, but I also edit this lovely podcast, and it's glad to be. I'm glad to be back from Japan. Dude, we missed you, man. You were like away from us for so long like you didn't go to a smoking bar to try to join us on the podcast it was very sad i mean i had i had my internet it's just that i had to i had to prioritize the time difference and that just would never have worked uh, um it's such a shame really it well, is. We're glad, very glad to have you back so uh Zach is our regular newsman, so he tries to ra- uh, wrangle us in whenever we get off topic. We also have uh, currently in the middle of a heated boss fight. Why is she invisible? <laughs> uh, that's John McCarroll, ladies and gentlemen. Um, resident boss killer. Uh, have you killed her yet? She's invisible. Just, dude, just get the Gatling laser and end her. There, there, there is no Gatling laser. I have my shotgun. John, I'd just like to, to let you know that invisible and invincible are not the same word. Uh, no, she's not invincible. She is invisible. She's invisible. All right, so, so keep trying. <laughs> okay, and then we have our resident Deus Ex hater. <laughs> I'm kidding, Kyle. <laughs> not going to respond to that because it's not true. <laughs> not quite. So that's Kyle uh, Miller joining us to talk about, of course, the big release of last week. And, of course, we're going to keep very uh, free of spoilers when we're talking about Deus Ex Human Revolution. So outside of the obnoxious boss yeah, fight that there, there, there may be technical um, spoilers or what, what, mechanical spoilers. Were? Mechanical spoilers, yeah. So if you don't want to hear about how we played the game – Perhaps not the best episode to listen to. Yeah, but... if you don't want to hear about how I picked up a fax machine and threw it at a hapless citizen just to see what it would do. It was kind of funny because it killed him on impact. <laughs> I was like, Rob, Ow. I think you have problems. I, I just wanted to see what it would do. So, uh, yeah, we're talking about Deus Ex Human Revolution. Uh, my review is up for PC. Uh, Steven's review is up for PS3. And we both kind of came to the exact same conclusion is that it's a very, very good game. We really enjoyed Almost all of it, except for uh, – what, what's that, John? What didn't we enjoy about it? Invisible bosses. <laughs> yes, that's right. So, uh, I mean, our opinions are really out there, so I want to get other people's uh, various ideas and opinions on the games out. So, uh, Zach, why don't we start with you because you're back – welcome back to the show. So what do you think of Deus Ex Human Revolution? I think it's pretty swell. I, it's it's the Metal Gear game that never existed, um, to put it one way. I think that, I don't know, this, this stealth is, is very Metal Gear-esque, and it's good. That sums it up pretty <laughs> pretty neatly. Zach's a little rusty. Uh, I no, was, I, I, I would 100% agree with you. I think the stealth mechanics are very Metal Gear. It's very uh, keep something between you and the enemies at any given time. You're not really hiding in the shadows and looking at a light meter like Splinter Cell or anything like that. The game is very black and white about whether you're detected or not. But I I agree very much with Zach. I found the, the stealth mechanics to be very, very satisfying. Now, I played the game primarily stealth. And I'm doing I'm doing the same. I'm about I don't know, let's say a little probably a little less than halfway through, like like three eighths through the game. Um, <laughs> and uh, I have been doing mostly stealth. I finally got a silencer for my pistol. It's in, so important, yeah. even though I've been using the stun gun most of the time. But um, it's very, so like very, very Metal Gear. That's like the vibe that I've been getting it from it the whole time. If you replaced Adam Jensen's name with, with Solid Snake, he still has that like grisly voice, you know. 
just just Metal Gear fanfic, except well, now, in Deus Ex form. Well, now the interesting thing is John was talking about going with an assault build and really focusing on the combat. And I'll be honest, every time I got into combat in that game, I just died really, really fast. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if that came as a result of being primarily stealth oriented. But my question well, is. John, if you can fry yourself away. Now, so the issue is, as I said, I was going to kill everything, which that's still the plan, and that's how I've been playing. But my build is very hacking oriented. So I actually don't have like any armor or any of the the weapon buffs. I'm all about getting past computers. Okay, okay. But now are you mostly in combat situations, like you walk into a room and you just end everybody in there, or are you, like, picking them off one at a time? Like, how are you um, going about d- it? It depends on the room. Like, I'm in I'm in Montreal right now, and I had to play a lot of uh, pussyfoot around because, honestly, um, I couldn't take a room full of eight guys all at once. Mm-hmm. Um, but... No, I I have been playing, I mean, the great majority of the game where if it's only two or three guys, I'm taking them head on and I'm saying, okay, GTFO, I'm going to kill you now. Kyle, how are you playing the game? Well, I'm not a violent person in real life, so when I play a game with guns, I want to use them. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So I plan to, you know, just shoot everybody in the head. But, and that's how I played like the first, the first area, Detroit. Um... But I didn't find it very fun. They're just, I don't know, combat, the actual combat isn't very satisfying. So I started kind of doing more stealth, and I'm finding that that is a lot more fun. I See, would wh- totally agree. Wh- what I find interesting is that um, the that game reminds me a lot of the original Mass Effect in that combat is still very driven around your abilities and not necessarily your skill, mm-hmm. um, unless, of course, you get like a laser sight or something like that, which gives you direct control over where your bullets are going. John, you're going to have to stop playing because we can hear shotgun shells in the background. Well, then. <laughs> <laughs> I saw Zach was writing a note through Skype that was going to be like, John, you got to turn the game down. Yep. Uh, but no, I, I 100% agree. Like whenever uh, a stealth situation went really badly for me and I had to rely on the weapons, I it felt okay, but it didn't feel satisfying. What's satisfying to me in this game is when I'm able to completely circumnavigate an area of enemies and get to my objective without anyone seeing me. I mean, first off, the game gives you a huge experience bonus if you can pull that off. But it's also just very satisfying from a like tactical standpoint. And what I found in this game over and over again that was so satisfying was I would look at the situation. I'd be like, holy God, how the hell am I going to get through this? And then I would just kind of look around the environment. And, of course, there's always a vent. There's always a vent <laughs> right where it needs to be. Or there's always a, like, a heavy object that you can lift and move to access a different area. But it very much feels dynamic. It never feels like you're being pushed down a particular route uh the first big mission or the mission that bridges uh the detroit and hangsha hubs i was so like impressed with that mission because i did it one complete way on my first playthrough and then i just picked a completely different entrance the second time i played through the game i just had a very different experience the second time was so much easier than the first time and, but I didn't feel like I was pushed down any particular path. I felt like I was the one investigating the environment and figuring out the best way to go about the situation. And for me, that is so rewarding when I'm playing this game. I hear you. Like, I, I get the most reward of um, shooting people in the face. <laughs> and I'm the violent one, right? <laughs> well, I mean, like, I, I'm really enjoying the fact where, where combat in this game is... I know Kyle was saying he wasn't enjoying combat... Combat is not, okay, I'm going to go shoot all those guys right there, is you have to be more tactical about it. It feels more like a Ghost Recon or a uh, name your tactical shooter here rather than a Gears of War or a Halo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the things that I definitely – that definitely contributes to that is the the fact that someone with a pistol can kill you in three shots. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Like, no. you, you're, you're not a bullet sponge in this game. There is recharging health, um, but it, it recharges slowly, and you 
don't ever have an option. Like if you if you are in the line of fire, you need to get out or you will have to reload your save. Yeah. I'm yeah. playing on Deus Ex mode right now, the hardest difficulty. I don't know why. I'm just a masochist. And I'm playing it and the number of times that I've been headshot, it's like disgusting. Like the the guy literally just puts a bead on your head and just ends you like I'm pure stealth on my second playthrough because the enemies are so dangerous. Mm-hmm. And I, I like that, but it, it does kind of it does kind of create a little bit of a disconnect because when the first CG trailers for this game came out, when they're showing you things like Adam is just tearing people apart and it's always been mm-hmm. like, you know, the melee takedowns and shotgun blast to the face. One of the trailers for the game had him like coming in through, you know, a ceiling and, you know, shooting four dudes with a shotgun. You try to do that in the actual game, you're just <laughs> dead. <laughs> You just yeah. die the shotgun, really fast. Shotgun's always one of my most favorite weapons in any, pretty much any game. But in this game, it kind of sucks. Yeah, it's no, just disagree. <laughs> <laughs> disagree. Should I, the shotgun has been because here's the thing: the shotgun is not the most powerful weapon in the game, and you don't get the most ammo out of it. Even if you shoot an armored target in the head with a shotgun, though, at relatively close range, they're gonna die. And yeah. that's what I've been doing most. Is it's okay. There is a guy there. Okay, I am going to shoot him in the head with this shotgun. You have to be more tactical with it. But if you get them in the head with the shotgun, it does a whole lot of damage. Yeah. The the heavily armored dudes, the ones that you start seeing around Hengsha, I tried to take one of those guys head on, and he just ended me. Like, I must have shot him like eight or nine times with with the pistol, and he was just shrugging it off. And I was like, oh, okay, well, I'm going to avoid him. And then I got him in a melee move, and that was really satisfying just to, like, you know, tear him that, apart with, that, his, with my, you know, arm knives. I One thing that I find very interesting is that I keep a stun gun the entire game because you get a heavily armored guy that's going to take four shotgun shells. Guess what? You shoot him once with the stun gun, and he is out. Yeah, the mm-hmm. stun gun is probably the best weapon in the game. Like yeah. that, I love that stun. You get the, you can actually get the stun gun in the first real mission of the game if you ask for a non-lethal close-range weapon. I say go with that because that stun gun is so powerful. It it is like your, you know, get out of crap free button. Like the second that something really goes wrong, if an enemy mm-hmm. sees you and they're coming to investigate, you just wait for them to come around that corner and you just do like a tase real quick. It is the best weapon in the game. See, it's funny because I got the stun gun uh, when I when I was given the option, but I found myself wishing that I had the the tranquilizer rifle just oh, because I like hate the tranq rifle. The tranq rifle sucks. I hate. Really? I, hate I don't it. know. I just like I. There is something the the stun gun doesn't have a very long range, so you have sure. to. It's like it kind of plays into that tactical positioning thing. Is like I need to tase one of these guys so I can take down the other, unless you have that one augmentation. Which John loves so much. Uh, um, yeah, I'm going to murder two guys at once. Well, yeah. the uh, the, um. the the thing that I wanted to point out, and then we'll get back we'll get back to Zach. I just I don't want to lose it real quick. This game, even more like Metal Gear, it rewards the non-lethal approach. The non-lethal oh, yeah. options always cause the least amount of noise. And what I found with the Trank rifle was that. Even the fact that it was a non-lethal weapon, it was setting off alarms, and and people were getting really? alerted to it. And- and so I said, okay, well, now I'm going to go with the stun gun. You can stun somebody two feet away from another person, and if their back's turned, they do not hear a thing. Yeah. The one thing that I found most frustrating about the Trank rifle is that the Trank rifle – so you can shoot someone with the Trank rifle, and then another guard comes up, and they're like, hey, wake up, dude. Why are you taking a nap? And with the stun gun, they don't wake them up. It's just like, oh, he's on the ground. Okay. Mm-hmm. So oh, it's really? – yeah, it's a more effective stealth weapon because I suppose I don't know playing playing to the Metal Gear analogy. I did I uh, I shot someone with a, a trank rifle, which brought over another guy uh, <laughs> who went to go wake him up, and then I shot him with the trank rifle. And by by the end, I had cleared this room, and there was a pile of about six bodies, <laughs> all just like asleep because of the the janky ai routines which you know is is not entirely dissimilar to how metal gear works but yeah well the um i started getting really good and uh this this kind of gets into the melee takedowns. so the melee takedowns you have these batteries uh that power adam and at the start of the game you have two every Mm -hmm. 
melee takedown that you use, non-lethal or lethal, uses up a whole battery. And now the conceit from the developers was that without that mechanic, everybody just walked around and meleeed everyone. And uh, trust me, it would have happened. Like oh, yeah. the, the melee takedown, like I, there's a part in the game where like someone pulled a gun on me and I just full on punched him in the face real quick and just that was so gratifying. But if you got to use the melee takedown all the time, that's all you would do. And so what I started to get really good at before I got the augmentation to let me take down two guys at once was I would tase one guy and then run up to the other and melee him. <laughs> That's and, what I've been doing so far. Yeah, and there was this really like – you start thinking because you have uh, – you, you basically take a protein shake and you get those <laughs> energy bars back. And so there's this real like risk-reward system of, OK, I have three batteries left. I'll use one on him and then I'll sneak up on the other guy and tase him. And I love that tactic tactical feeling where mm -hmm. I feel like I'm the one who's deciding things. I know a lot of people are down on that, but I think without that, the game would have been way too easy. It oh, definitely. Was, I like, mean, I, I dislike that you own, you're only left with uh, one battery, no matter how many batteries you have and how many levels of recharge that you've put augmentation or praxis points into. Uh, but I, I wish that like you you had even even just two because when you use augmentations like the the see through walls augmentation or oh, the yeah. the silent walking augmentation or stealth I don't know if uh, the the typhoon thing uses yeah, any uses any batteries that really wow yeah, yeah you see it just when you use any of those like active augmentations it will drain a little bit and then it takes a little while to recharge and I found myself stuck in situations where I was on that last battery use the see through walls. And then went to go take the guy down, oh, yeah. and, like walked right up to him, and nothing happened because I didn't have a full battery left. Yeah. And I mean, it's not, you know, it's, it's, I agree that like for balance issues, you definitely can't have all of the, uh, all of the takedowns just like, you know, free. But I do wish that there was something like, like either like half a battery or, or some, some sort of buffer zone that you what? didn't have to keep up on your. I think the two best pieces of advice I can give gamers for playing this game, uh, one, always have two batteries. Mm -hmm. Always have two because you never know when you might need a melee one. And if you use even a little bit of that first battery, you can use the melee takedown, but it will take away the whole one. Yeah. So you always want to have two. And then the, mm -hmm. the other real big piece of advice I can give – don't use all your Praxis points right away. Now, this is the best thing about this game, in my opinion. You can get through this whole game without augmentations. The augmentations enhance Adam. They enhance the main character, and they make the situations easier. But you do not need them to complete any aspect of the game. Uh, obviously, it would be much more difficult if you didn't use them, though. So what I found was I was always keeping like two or three Praxis points for in case I met a situation that I really wanted to explore and I didn't have the means to do so. Like, you know, I'd have hacking level three and I didn't know if I was going to find a hacking level four door in this area. So I would keep a Praxis yeah. point on reserve. That saved my butt a lot. The problem became when I got to the boss fights and I was so built for stealth. Are we ready to talk about the boss fights, John? Uh, I'm still fighting Invisible Girl, so yes, I suppose. <laughs> I, I wanted to put in my review uh, – Kyle and I talked about this before. I wanted to put in my review that like I feel bad that I complained about the Witcher 2 boss battles. I still don't think they're good, but they are freaking masterpieces compared to these boss battles in Human Revolution. They're so bad. They're so, so bad. They just – this game is about player choice and about going about things and doing it your own way. And then you get to these boss battles where it's just a character walking at you and shooting you. And there's really no subtlety to it. There's nothing you can really do. You just have to run around the environment, find ammo, find grenades, and throw them at this boss fight. And it just I, – I feel like they should just take them out, honestly. They should make the boss fights optional. Uh, I don't know if, if optional like – if they're going to do one or the other, I'd say, you know, like, do it. But um, I, I – it's – I I, the, I came from this as having read a whole bunch of reviews that have said the boss fights are terrible and you know everything about you know like blah 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 boss fights are terrible you know like they ruined my my no death playthrough and you know like I'm a I'm a good human being and blah 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 and you know they're not good I will not give them the credit of being good but they aren't 
so horrible as everyone says. Like it, com, you know, sure compared to the rest of the game, compared to the stealth mechanics that you know like work so well with uh, you know like the the different ways that you can play through the game and explore and the discussion trees that you can go down. Uh, you know, like they're garbage, but you know, th- it's not like the the game is broken. I think the first boss fight's bro- broken. I thought the rest of them were pretty easy. I think John would well, have a very different opinion. Well, right I think the first boss fight was freaking easy, and the second <laughs> boss fight is incredibly difficult. Maybe I just had a really big gun, and I got lucky because I took her out no problem. The first boss fight was – I thought I was doing something wrong, and what it really came down to was there was no – the game wasn't giving me any information that what I was doing was correct. There was no health bar. The character, the first boss, wasn't really flinching when I shot him in the face with a shotgun. There was no reciprocity. There was no give and take from the game. So I start running around the environment, and I start thinking, is this like a God of War boss fight, and I need to find the switch to – to the crank that you know drops the boulder on him like what do i need to do here and so eventually it just came down to nah just shoot him in the face a lot and i just this game was developed by uh by idos montreal not not capcom you don't need to find the hexagonal crank (laughs) i was looking for it i was actually looking for it and i just kyle did you have problems with the boss fights or the first boss fight i've only done the first one it took me maybe 10, 15 minutes, you know, several mini tries, and I, you know, I swore at it profusely, but <laughs> it, I mean, it never really, I never, like, wanted to quit or anything. It didn't get really personal. I think yeah. it was, I think it's just bad because, one, they don't prepare you for it. I mean, there's nothing like that before that point. Like, they don't ease you into these massively augmented armored brutes that just walk toward you no matter what and the other thing is or invisible ones (laughs) or invisible ones and the other thing is they don't let you do it the way you want like there's only one way to do that fight yeah and it's basically with grenades rocket launcher and or heavy artillery like that's it or shotgun or shotgun it's it's just such a it's a real bummer feeling. It's a real feeling of – again, to go back to the Arkham Asylum analogy, like Arkham Asylum didn't need bar- boss fights. It was a perfectly fine game on its own, and then you get to that point, and it's just like you're fighting Poison Ivy or you're fighting Bane, and it just – it's not fun. But I understand the desire to have a huge set-piece moment, to have this real – cathartic and like when i play deus ex i'm very high strong maybe that's why i like the space marine demo so much was because it was the ultimate like get away from deus ex like being high strong and looking all around you i just wanted to kill orcs but then you you want to have that moment in the actual game but it just doesn't gel with how the game's been constructed adam is not designed as an action hero he's designed as kind of a lithe stealthy slinky character he's not designed to go toe-to-toe with someone yeah i think that's that's one of the main problems i had have with the game is that just they say that you can you know go stealth or combat or you know all these different ways but it seems like there is a right way to play the game the stealth the stealth is the most heavily favored. I would agree. Yeah. I would. Agree. I, I don't know if I'd say like right way as the as the phrase, but there is a better way to play the game. Right. And, yeah. And there is like you are more rewarded for playing stealthily, uh, yeah. in in that you don't get shot to bits and have to reload even, your save. Even <laughs> down to the individual experience awarded for each kill. Like if you're just shooting them and you don't shoot them in the head, you get ten. Whereas if you take them down and don't kill them, you get like fifty. Yeah, no, that's true. That's true. I think the game, there's a lot of Metal Gear influence on the game. I mean, we've kind of joked about mm-hmm. it, but the whole, I don't want to give away spoilers. I'm not going to spoil but like the whole last quarter of the game is so Metal Gear, it's almost painful. Like, and people will know when they get to that point. And then the, like, even the boss battle, boss battle achievements are named sort of like, you know, uh, Metal Gear bosses. So there is this desire by the development team to, I think try to ape some of the Metal Gear mechanics, and for the most part, they do a great job. I mean, this is probably the best the best stealth game I've played since Snake Eater. Like I, it, yeah, I, I always say that stealth is really difficult to do, and I don't think I've played a a 
great stealth game since Thief, actually, but like it does a pretty good job. I'm now that I'm doing stealth more, I'm much I'm enjoying it much more. There are some AI glitches here yeah. and there. Like they, there was there was one instance like I, I think I was stuck on one section close to the end of the game, like one specific hallway. I must have restarted like ten times just because something kept going wrong. But that's very minimal. And I can let that go because let's be honest here. Stealth games are inherently trial and error. Since you're playing as a character that can't take on a whole room full of guys and what happens if you're seen is you end up taking on a whole room full of guys, <laughs> like yeah. it's going to be trial and error. But then to make it so satisfying, and I thought it was interesting that you brought up Thief because these are the guys that are going to be making the next Thief game. And I think they've Just, got yeah. – yeah, they've got a really good starting plan. I'm really excited – to see the next Thief game. Yeah. So, I I don't know if we want to talk any more about Deus Ex. Can think, we... Yeah. Could we touch on story aspects a little bit? Sure. Uh, I mean, without spoiling anything, obviously. Yeah, go for it, Kyle. Go for it. Well, I'd actually like to hear from you, Rob, somebody who's beaten the game um, without spoiling anything. Sure, sure. sure. Um, I did find the story a little difficult to follow because it is kind of that political intrigue and a lot of characters are talked about before they're seen on screen. And mm. so there there were moments where I was completely mystified what I should be doing. Like I had the mission objective, you know, go here and find this guy and talk to him. And I was like, OK, what did he do again? Like, I can't remember because it doesn't introduce characters as well as I think it should. The the part that John's at right now, the story gets a little silly, and then it kind of re- it recovers, and it gets and that point that John's at makes sense later on in the game. But the biggest, I, I think, the ideas, the touchstones that this game is is harping on the whole, you know, becoming more than human, having conservative groups that are very, you know, anti augmentation, having people that really need these augmentations, the whole. Uh, the idea that these things don't inherently take and you can have rejection syndrome. There's some really great ideas here from a storytelling perspective, and I think they really touch on some great things. The problem is that the ending to this game is so abrupt, and it does the ultimate faux pas for a game that has multiple endings where your final decision and the final ramification of the whole game literally comes down to a choice between several buttons. The story, mm. it doesn't live up, unfortunately. I think the story, what it, the overarching part of it is very interesting, and I want to see the game further developed. But you can tell that these guys reached a point where they said, okay, either we're going to have to develop this game for another year or we get it out now. And so the the story feels very abrupt. It feels very chopped. So I didn't find the story to be very satisfying, but I found the ideas that were going on to be very intriguing, if that makes sense. So so here's yeah. a question. Does does it really matter? Because I, I mean like granted, you know, like we're RPG fan, we're supposed to care about RPGs and a big part of RPGs are stories, but I've been having a great time with this game just kind of like doing what it says and enjoying the mechanical experience of like sneaking around a factory or a warehouse or, or some like small section of China or what, you know, like whatever, uh, you know, like the game is going to throw at me next. I have a feeling that I'm going to enjoy it a lot. And so it's a, it's a gameplay game as Mm -hmm. stupid as that may sound. It's a gameplay game. This is a game that's driven. I think you have, Games like Deus Ex and Dark uh, Demon Souls. I was going to say Dark Souls. You have games like Deus Ex, Demon Souls, very mechanics-driven games, very very much games that are fun to play. And then you have games like Witcher 2 and Mass Effect, which are tremendous storytelling games. But I personally, this is just personal, I don't enjoy the mechanics as much. So I had more fun playing deus ex for example than i had the last big uh title of this year which was witcher 2 but witcher 2 story just you know demolishes deus ex it's so much more interesting the the things that are going on are much more interesting but i found deus ex to be a very satisfying gamey game and that's what i look for though and i, I think kyle and i that that's where we disagree sometimes so i see where deus ex might let him down a little bit because the story 
isn't as good as it could be. It doesn't it doesn't have that huge ending. It doesn't do the things that it really should. But I found the game to be very, very fun to play. And so I can look past the storytelling deficiencies because it was just really fun to slink around environments, hack computers. I love the hacking game in this in, in this game. It's really, it's really solid. I love the hacking mini game. I feel so cool when I'm doing it. And like I've had people walk by while I'm playing it. And they're like, what the hell are you doing? And you feel like you're actually hacking something. The, the, the hacking minigame is good because it, it's adequate risk reward. Like yeah. it's um, it, it's set up in such a way where um, you can get stuff to make you better, but it comes at a price is, oh, am I going to get caught? Am I going to have someone come after me Yep. if I do this, which I, I thought was great. Also, she is no longer invisible. She is dead. Good job. Congratulations. Yay. Good job. So yeah, I, I wanted to bring it back to the story a little bit. Um, yeah. I like games that, you know, I like games that go the focus on story. That's fine. And some games focus on gameplay. That's totally cool with me. But I think games can do both, like, oh, yeah. equally well. I mean, oh, I, because I always have a game to measure it up against, you know, something that does both equally well. It's really, really fun to play and has an intriguing story, or at least like, even if, even if the story, God, <laughs> you had to, you had to uh, say, that. Uh, yep. even if the story is not like, you know, fantastic and could be a novel or something, it should at least be t- well told. And that's yeah. kind of where I'm having problems in Deus Ex. It seems really badly told. At least in the beginning, it seems like it's trying to, it's like defeating itself. Like it wants you to know what's going to happen next. And it, I don't know if it's maybe not quite as predictable as it seems. It gets, I think the best part of Deus Ex is when you're reading the emails and you get the peripheral stuff and that, yeah. adds, and that adds to the game. And, and I wish uh, Steven was here right now because he could talk about all the numerous connections to the original game. I think that's where the storytelling is really good. But I would agree with you there. I, I mean, honestly, uh, about midway through Hangsha, I had no clue what I was doing. I had no clue. I had to sit down and read through my whole mission profile again. I was like, what am I doing? Like, yeah. I, I know there's uh, something bad happened and I can't remember. And it, it has to do with characters being discussed off screen without you seeing them. Even something as simple as showing a picture of the character that you're talking about would go a long way toward me identifying them for me it just seems really predictable it's it it is a little predictable it it gets better i think the ending to the game even though it's abrupt is interesting but it is abrupt it is very abrupt just to, to, to add to my point what i realize now is um it's not it's not the story that matters when you're talking about the emails i realize like oh it's you know like what what there's what is such a laudable achievement in regards to the creation of this game outside of the gameplay, like the the other aspect and what I've been enjoying is the world, the world that it creates and the world that you play in. Um, I think that kind of sums up my my position pretty yeah. pretty adequately. Like you, you're you're not playing the, the game for you know like whatever political intrigue. Like for for a long time, uh, I guess you go through the whole Detroit section of the game in the course of one game day. And I assume that, you know, like I was just kind of like off doing side missions, uh, for a while and then got back to the main story and they're like, Oh yeah. You know, like he, you know, he left earlier today. I'm just like, Oh wow. You know, like, <laughs> yeah. I think though, there's a point where, I don't know. One thing that bugs me in games is when the story doesn't give you a compelling reason to be doing what you're doing. Yeah. And like right now in the game, it's not, I, like, I feel like a that. tool. <laughs> no, I can. I, Kyle, I totally see that. Wait, honestly. Wait, wait, wait. I'm, I'm sorry. When you say you feel like a tool, are you saying that you feel like you're being used by someone, or like I, I'm? I, no, I'm actually asking what what are what what version of tool are you? Oh, using? okay. I see what you mean. I see what you mean. I thought you were gonna make a Swiss Army knife joke. No, 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 no. no. I'm asking. No, if you I know. Can. Yeah, I know what you're asking. The answer is both. <laughs> <laughs> so I, think. I, I can definitely see that, and I think that that's where Deus Ex, you know can definitely improve in the next game. And I, I, I don't think it's a perfect game. I mean, I, I found it to be very fun to play, even though the story didn't grab me as much as I was hoping. I didn't really connect with Adam as a character, 
But I think what made the game so fun to me was just the actual gameplay of this game was very fun. I have complaints about the gameplay. I, I think for God's sake, developers, a new game plus needs to be freaking standard at this point. You get Adam so powerful at the end yeah. of this game. And all I want to do is take him through the game again, all powered up. And of course they don't let you because, you know, that would be fun. So I, it's stupid stuff like that. I think some augmentations are very useless. Yeah. And I, the, you, you say that it should be easy. It, it's very difficult to... To design a game around that. I, I know. No, no, no. I mean, like, like you, you look at... Uh, uh, you look at Chrono Trigger, and Chrono Trigger is set up in very specific ways so that it's not broken. Right. When you come back as an ultra powerful character, you know, say you have, you know, the augment that jumps makes you jump really high at the very beginning of the game. Well, it's possible that there's some area that they built using the tools that they had where if you jumped there, you would jump outside the world. You're right. You're right. I just wish yeah. that. I wanted to play a new game plus with this game, and that was a little disappointing. And I think some augmentations, a little underutilized, a little useless. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right that some of the augments are are useless. Yeah, there. I was kind of disappointed in that. Yeah. Like, but, I, but I think that those are real nitpicks for what is an overall solid game. And I, I really – but one interesting thing that I did walk away from this game – was that I, I walked away from it and I, I started it up again and I'm really enjoying it the second time, but I think after the second time I'm going to be done because there is very much a binary choice of how to go about doing things, particularly when you're completing missions. And I, I think this is Zach yelling at us right now that we want to move on to Bastion here in a second, so I'll make this really short. Uh, so there, I don't know if I'm going to play it again, but I do think that um, – the other game that I've been playing for the past couple months, which was uh, Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines, I think that game does the Deus Ex formula, even though that game is completely broken in the last quarter. That game does the Deus Ex formula of multiple ways of going about doing things, I think a little bit better than Human Revolution. Human Revolution is more linear, but it's not broken. You can never break Adam in this character. You can never make a character that is all like, well, I can't complete this, that, or the other thing. And that's what's awesome. Meanwhile, Vampire is much more open-ended, but you can get into positions where you, you're, there's no way you're going to complete this. Yeah, I had to cheat to beat that game. Yeah. Oh, the last quarter of that game is, is just atrocious. But I think that by making Human Revolution a little bit more linear, they made it a little bit better to play as a gameplay experience. And I, I would rather have the game keep me from breaking my character like i got some useless augmentations while i played the game the first time but it didn't kill me it didn't come back to bite mm -hmm. me. and i think that's a huge thing so i don't mean to cut yeah. us off on deus ex but i, I, know we... I, 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 I want like two minutes real quick sure. to talk. Uh, so one thing that i was disappointed with in the augmentations and actually go goes kind of the opposite of an augmentation that was useless the casey mod which is the social mod I love I, that thing. <laughs> no, it was nice, but it was really disappointing that there was just that one level. It wasn't like, oh, you get certain cues if you have this mod and certain cues if you have this mod and certain data if you have this mod. It was just kind of like, oh, great. You're awesome at social. It's all or nothing. <laughs> the social mod is like True. the most overpowered thing at the beginning. I got that first. And yeah, everyone, everyone, or, everyone should. Yes, least. you win because you get those huge experience bonuses and – you just win every argument. <laughs> like you just yeah. like Adam is just the man. It's pheromones, man. Pheromones, yeah. So I think Human Revolution is a great game. I think it'll be interesting to see how it holds up here in the next couple months. But I say bravo to Eidos Montreal. I think you guys made a really good game. This was their first game, and it's very impressive. I'm really excited mm -hmm. to see what they do with the next Thief. I'm I'm a neophyte to Thief. I've never played a Thief game before. Oh, you gotta play it. First. I'm really excited to play it. And I think that if they can continue the day, I think Deus Ex is going to sell phenomenally well. I think it is going to break the MPD. I, I think it's going to sell well. I think people are going to like it. And I think we're going to see another game. And let's see what they do. I think they could really open this up and make something really special. More special than Bastion. That's a lie. <laughs> okay, okay. I'm Bastion being unfair. Is I'm being unfair. I, I really like Bastion. Um, okay, uh, go ahead and talk. Uh, about has everyone played Bastion? Uh, I've yep. played a short amount of it. Kyle? 
Yeah, I played it for PC. I beat it twice. Mm. Did you play with oh, PC? Right. Did you play it with mouse and keyboard or with a gamepad? Mouse and keyboard. Okay. I I, have- I, I played it on uh, on PC as well. I played with the gamepad and and Rob will bring up one of his complaints, which is the controls and not being able to target an enemy that he likes. But for those challenges, use the mouse and keyboard controls. Okay. Um, but yeah, so Bastion is uh, a game. Uh, for those of you who are unaware, uh, by by developers, Supergiant Games, they're a new studio. They were just founded, I believe, last summer, or or earlier than that. But uh, the Bastion, like the first news of Bastion being a game, uh, came out last summer, and uh, it's I think there is about six people in that studio. It's, yeah, it's um, really small. There's I know I know uh, Greg Kasavin is the designer and writer. Uh, and, and, oh man, now I'm going to embarrass myself by not knowing anyone else's name. There, there, I think but, there's a mirror. There, mm-hmm. A mirror. Um, uh, Logan is, Logan Cunningham is the, is one of my favorite narrators of anything of all time. He's got, he's got that, that silky smooth Morgan Freeman voice, except that it's even almost, dare I say, almost better. Um, he's, he's up there. He's up there. Um, but yeah, so a very, very small studio, uh, and, and in my personal opinion, uh, a tremendous effort, uh, for, for what they've, what they've done. Um, all of the art is hand drawn, um, oh, the game and, is gorgeous. and it's the, just the gorgeous. tiles, um, kind of float up to need everything. It's awesome. Um, and Rob doesn't like it. I don't know why. Oh, oh okay. Here's <laughs> the thing. I, I sound like John now. I the art style in this game is just incredible. I mean, from an artistic standpoint, the look of the game is great. It is a little too easy to fall through the environment, and sometimes a hole isn't exactly that clear. But at least there's a very little penalty for that. My big thing with this game is that the combat is just not clicking for me. Like I just, it's very, it's an isometric game. It kind of plays like you would expect Diablo three to play on a console, which we all know that's going to happen. But f- like I'm about what? What do we say? Uh, five eighths through three the game. Eighths. Three, three eighths, eighths through the game. Okay, that's the running gag. About mm-hmm. three eighths through the game, and I find like the melee combat is very underpowered. I find it very hard to tell, you know, the the slight difference because all the characters, all the enemies are palette swaps at the beginning of the game for the most part, and some of them have unblockable attacks, and it's really hard to recognize which ones you have to block and whatnot. The ranged combat seems way more effective than melee. Like, I don't know why the hell you would play this game melee compact, uh, melee combat. Apparently, you get a stick at the game that's better, or a spear. <laughs> yeah, the spear. The spear is a very solid. That was that was my big melee weapon. But I mean, that's the thing is, like, it it's not a bad thing that you can play the game with two with two ranged weapons. I think that. Um, something that it's unfortunate that like none of the, the melee weapons are, are quite sticking for you. Um, but I, the, I, part of the, when I, when I talked to, uh, Greg Kasavin at PAX East, I asked him why do an action RPG? Like why, why pick a genre that is known for being so, so incredibly bland, um, at times. And he said that he, they chose this because they thought that they could bring something new. And I think that the, the options that you're given with customizing your character, with, I think, uh, I'm not sure off the top of my head exactly how many weapons there are. I think it's somewhere around like 11 or so. Each of those weapons performs very differently mm-hmm. and has it, you can like mix and match two different weapons. Each of them have two special attacks that you can get and then there's, in addition to that, um, uh, like different tonics that you can use. And the tonics, while they may not seem like such a, a deciding factor, you know, at the beginning, cool. once once you get more tonics and level up a couple more times and can, you know, like combine, you know, like mix and match like five different tonics, like towards the end of the game, I think I beat it at level six. Um you know, I had I had a tonic that gave me that minimized the damage that I would get from falling off the level, but then when I landed would do two hundred percent of the regular damage to enemies. So where falling off the level for you, Rob, was a bummer and like was, you know, oh well, it didn't do much. For me, it took off maybe like one hit point and then I decimated the group of enemies that was around me. And so like they, they present to you so many different 
like kind of unique gameplay experiences where you can kind of find your niche and and craft what you're trying to do. And this this follows through in the weapon customization as well. And so each weapon has um, you have to collect uh, different like items. So like for for the hammer, it's uh, it's like a heavy heavy object or something. There's, something heavy. Yeah, something exactly something heavy. Uh, and then, like, there's something pointy and something, yeah, I mean, uh, like, I, fearsome. And there's two different upgrade tracks for, for each weapon, kind of emphasizing oh, one side of it or the other. One one and, huge thing I want to say on that, thank God you could take away, you could change the upgrade mm-hmm. if you didn't like it. Because one of the upgrades for the Fang Repeater, for, the, like, the high-impact crossbow, was so freaking useless. I was just yelling and screaming at the game, like, why would you make an upgrade that breaks the weapon? It increased the spread of the crossbow so now it was just missing all the time and i was like why would you want like an upgrade is supposed to make your weapon better it's not granted at the same time like i don't know i don't remember that exact uh you know tree because i didn't use the repeater a lot but probably if you go down the rest of that tree the upgrade path looks something like uh you know like you know increase weapon spread but also increase um like the rate of fire and perhaps the amount of bullets oh yeah it, it increased and it's the rate of fire to, so now it's just missing a lot and i'm, I'm I, just... I have a feeling that like it's it's meant to then become like like a spread weapon they have basically each one each side of the tree is um you know is i, I love the spear is i think the my most memorable example where the left side of you know like the left path which you know you can pick either side for either one and switch freely back and forth the left side kind of increased the rate at which you could thrust the spear and the amount of damage that it did and the critical hit damage that it did and then the right side increased its effectiveness as a thrown weapon where you charge it up and then you throw the spear and finally you get you know like faster reloads and more spears thrown um i don't know i just between like the gameplay is not extraordinary it's it, you know it, it's still an action RPG, but I think that it's a very solid action RPG. And there's some there's some nuances that you can nitpick, and I will not disagree with you there. But I think that between the art and the narration and the story that they've put together, and the music is phenomenal. Oh my god, it's just wonderful. Uh, I just I think I was just looking for a little bit tighter gameplay experience. I I don't like these. I, I'm hoping Diablo three doesn't do this. I don't like these uh, isometric. What? Diablo three is made by a team of hundreds of people. I with, I know with I know. with I a know. budget of tens of millions of dollars. I know Bastion um, is a small game. I know Bastion I know. was made by six dudes. I know, and what they did was, was very impressive. Dollars. I know. I know. I know. But like, I don't like how in Bastion you take you can only take like four or five hits and then you're just dead really uh, like i die so fast in that game like i go from full health and then i'll get surrounded by like three enemies and, you know three tough enemies not like little roll more what so rob, rob I would get roll more. more yeah and then i fall yeah. off the level what, what do you think about mega man well mega man is just designed to punish you no I, I i get what you're saying but like i just also just to talk to that at exactly um there's a tonic which i think you get i don't know i don't even think you have to buy it at the store i think you just get it after you after you like level up a couple times maybe um is it gives you multiple lives you can start yeah, right back where you were with full health with, which i mean like you i know. don't think it's a bad game don't get me wrong and, and as a 15 dollar download i think it's a really good deal i just for whatever reason i'm not gelling with the combat like the combat and i just don't get along it feels very mashy with the melee like it's just you know, it, it, it's just That's the thing, though, is it's not a mashy game. It's like not meant to be a mashy right, game. But it's the like game tactical may- rolling. Did you know that if you stand still when you swing the hammer, it does a different attack, a different, yep. more powerful attack? Yep. I don't know. I just I think that like I think it's very maybe nuanced. maybe I'm just playing into the into the, the love fest too much. But I just I, I think that it's not immaculate, but impeccably made. And, and oh, yeah, I think, I, the, I think the, the word the- tremendous is. For for a team of six right. people. Okay, for a team of six people, I can see that. But I, I, I mean, I don't. Yeah, sorry, Kyle, go ahead. I went into it with very few expectations. I mean, I had seen positive reviews and stuff, but I hadn't really watched that much about it and everything. And it was coming out on PC, so you know, I thought I'd get it. And I hadn't before I played Bastion. I hadn't played any games for like a month, maybe, because I was just feeling like burnt out, just kind of pessimistic about video games in general. But this game. I kept thinking to myself, this is why I play video games. Because it was so much fun. 
-hmm. And at the same time, it looked good, it sounded good, and it had an intriguing or well-told story. Hmm. Yeah. I I can see it. I think that I I was having more fun when I figured out that using the shield was way better than rolling. Like I, I felt a lot better, you know, kind of doing the, you know, a couple hits and then shield. And I, I was liking that. But then, then the game just does the really obnoxious stuff that, you know, is endemic of using a game pad. So I want to try it with the PC. Like it decides which enemies I'm going to hit at range and it never hits the one I want to. It, you know, sometimes the shield won't come up, you know, and I'll, I'll, for whatever reason, I'll be facing the wrong way with my shield because I was just shooting that guy. Guy, but now I want to block this guy. It, it's little things like that. But again, you guys are 100% right. This is a team of six dudes. It's a $15 game. If you look at it like that, it's a great purchase. Um, I I, while while I agree that it is a great purchase, I would not just on a on a moral and ethical level of, of video game price per value ratio. I don't like talking about that. Um, but yeah, it's a great purchase. You should buy it. Yeah, I would not pay sixty dollars for this game, like I at all. I would. I, I don't know. I would. Not. I mean, it's really short, and that's probably perhaps the only thing really wrong with it. But even, I mean, can't say it's really wrong with it. It's made by six people, but I think that I had more fun that, with it than most sixty dollars games. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Gr- I, granted, with the advent of Steam and like other Amazon deals and whatnot, I don't think I've paid full price for a game in a very long time. But um, yeah, the the equivalent of that that level of quality, I think, carries over. I think that what what Super Giant Games has done is equivalent in quality to it. Certainly, I think it's it's as good a game, although different than Deus Ex. <laughs> I think so. Uh, okay. I think okay, so. Yeah, that's think that's so. your opinion. That's your opinion. I mean, I, actually, right now, I think I like Bastion better. I mean, it was more fun. I, I just, I find all the enemy types in Bastion to be annoying. Like, I just don't enjoy the, I just don't enjoy the combat in that game. And if you don't enjoy the combat, the like. Like, that's, that. I mean, Grant, that's, you know, like, that's the long and short of it is that, like, if you don't gel and, like. I, I know a thing or two about not gelling with games. You yeah, know, you don't like, like Space Marine. There's something wrong with you. It's, you know, and you don't like Uncharted. <laughs> so there's something wrong well, with you. Well, no, there's it. something wrong with all of the world except for me, for people okay. liking Uncharted. <laughs> yeah, so like, you know, I don't know. That's yeah, true. It's, it's true. I, I guess I just, I like games that, uh, maybe this is it. Uh, maybe it kind of goes with the Uncharted and Space Marine thing. I like games that make me feel powerful. And when I play a game like Bastion, I don't feel powerful when i play a game like uncharted i don't feel powerful when i play a game like space marine and i jump up in the air and land on like 80 dudes like and they all pop like pimples well is is the main character in uh in space marine named the kid does the kid strike you as someone who should be incredibly powerful i know i know but that's just those are the kind of games that i enjoy john i enjoy games that make me feel strong the thing is with bastion though is that by the end of the game you've i don't know at least for me i i I customized my character to how i wanted to play and upgraded the weapons just so and i was like you know like playing with the 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 idle configurations which you'll get later a little later yeah that's kind of kind of tweak the challenge in the game that's Um, cool and i I found I found that like this game was you know like I was able to tailor it so perfectly to my needs and like the the progression the sense of progression and like what each weapon was able to do throughout the game I just found so I don't know I found the 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 progression of power to be much more rewarding than having you know like the character in Space Marine who I mean I you know I haven't played anything but the demo and I didn't even beat that because I was so bad at it but uh, you know, it just like I, I enjoyed that progression. It was almost more RPG like than than other RPGs I've played because it's, you know, I am growing as a, you know, like, as a character. And I don't know, just I think that we, I think I'm we gonna, should probably move on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm there's gonna, not much more to yeah, say. But. I'm going to keep playing it. I, I, what you brought to my attention that I hadn't realized was that I could use two ranged weapons at once. Mm-hmm. So I am going to try that. I mean, I want to give it a fair shot. I want to beat it. I'm already, you know, what, five A's through, three A's through. So I, I want to beat it. I don't think it's a bad game, and I think it's a great $15 purchase. It's just, I guess I'm not feeling the Bastion Love Fest 
that mm. a lot of people feel. I'm, it's I'm a just shame. not seeing it. Well, uh, I, just one, you should check out. Do do try the uh, the weapon challenges because those will definitely help you to to kind of figure out ways that you may not have used the weapons in the past, and yeah. they, you know, like they kind of reveal those other nuances. Okay, um, I so, can see yeah, Rob so, getting really furious at those though. Yeah, uh, most yeah, likely. Definitely. Most likely. Oh, oh, you should see me when I play the God of War challenge rooms. I just send people away. I've kicked girlfriends out of the apartment. I'm like, no one be around me right now because there's going to be a <laughs> lot of cursing. Keep like, it classy. Oh, oh, there's no class when I beat a God of War challenge room. There is just yelling and screaming. Whew. Okay, I think it's time for news, Zach. Are you ready to do I think this? So I'm yeah, so I, ready. You, you haven't done this for a while, so I know. I've been. I've been. Been I've the been wagon. ready, but I've I've followed uh, John's lead. So here we go. Do you do you like Parasite Eve two? You know I, I I've heard Parasite Eve two isn't that great, but I'm willing to give it a shot. Well, if you were intending to, now is the best time because it's Woo-hoo. coming to it's coming to PSN. Um, yeah. So so finally, now that uh, third birthday, the the glory of a game that that was is out. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, you can now play Parasite Eve two. Uh, it's a six dollar download on the PlayStation Network store. Um, That's worth. And I don't know. I mean, I I enjoyed what I played of the first game. It is very old. Um, oh. It's a, it's an old. I played one of those games, but. I can't remember which one. Another PSN release, actually, that wasn't on our our list of things to discuss, but Breath of Fire 4, also out on PSN. Ooh, yeah, been, I want to check that out. Is is there a good Breath of Fire game? Dragon Quarter. I, I thought it was... I, 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 I thought for the ones before Dragon Quarter, it was the even ones that were good, or was it the odd ones? I don't know. I think I it was know. the even one. I gotta ask my buddy Brian. I've, He's big into I've never been able to get through one. Yeah. yeah, so so those two, so we have uh, Parasite Eve 2 and Breath of Fire 4 that are now out on PSN, so check those out. Uh, another release, Shin Megami Tensei, De- uh, Devil Survivor Overclocked for the 3DS, um, which is now available. And so that's the the remake of, or I guess not a remake, reboot, re-whatever. Yeah, uh, it's the, the, the DS game ported to, uh, port, that's the word to the 3ds uh adds you know some some new monsters a new kind of extra day scenario uh with full voice acting for so that's kind of nifty for a 3ds game but uh check that out uh 39.99 at your local retailer um now we have something very thrilled about is uh a new visual novel from the 999 team yay um and it's coming out on the ds right Mm, uh, no. it's it's coming out on the 3ds and the vita uh, so you have your choice of you know next gen portable which uh, you, know, you mean the one that's really next gen or the one that just does fancy effects uh i would argue that neither of them are next gen and that the ipad the ipad is i think you win that I mean, argument like, yeah, <laughs> as as much as i do love the portable scene the ipad's gone where they aren't um but yeah so the the uh the new game is uh I'm not uh, as as much as I love uh, Japanese and enjoyed my time in Japan. I'm not going to dare try to pronounce it. Uh, it t- roughly translates to extreme escape, extreme escape adventure. Good people die. Um, <laughs> I think there. I remember reading a more nuanced translation of that. But that. I want that to be the actual title. Good it might. It might. I read another. Trans- it might have been like "Good People Die Too" or something like that. But um, if you look at the the cast of characters, it looks oddly like uh, nine nine nine. Or at least the the character designs do, and I'm sure it's because it's the same team. But uh, you know, I'm sure we'll be hearing more about that in the future. And uh, was 999 successful? I remember I loved it. I still need to beat like the last ending on that. But I'm not sure uh, how. It's... I, I think it did well for for access in here in mm-hmm. North America. Certainly, I, I think better than their expectations. That was all us. That was all yeah. us talking about. Oh yeah. The podcast. Oh yeah. That was all us. So. Um, yeah, and and so this, uh, like like Shin Megami Tensei Devil Survivor Overclocked, will be fully voiced, uh, and so I'm Ooh. interested. It, it could be a good thing and it could be a bad thing. If that it, always if makes the Japanese me nervous. Voices, I, I, but I I have heard not so good things about the voices, unfortunately, which is odd for an Atlas game, because Atlas is tends this... to be really good about for Overclocked or uh, yeah for Overclocked. I'm sorry, did I? I, I yeah, thought no, you meant I thought you meant nine nine nine. Oh, 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 I. Extreme die. escape adventure, good people die. <laughs> um, yeah, did, so did they, guys, just on a side note, did you guys hear the new voice acting for Silent Hill 2? No. 
I think it might actually be worse. And I didn't think that was possible. <laughs> I didn't realize they were doing new voice acting. Yeah, is this they, the HD version? Yeah, for the HD versions of Silent Hill Collection, they're, re, they're redoing the voice acting at least for Silent Hill 2 because they don't want to pay the actors again. Oh, that's a bummer. And I, I was like, okay, because that the original voice acting, let's be honest, isn't that great. It, it was kind of in that nebulous area where, like, apparently Kojima Productions were the only ones that did good English but translation. It, and it, Is Silent Hill 2 the one where I – I, I haven't played any of the Silent Hill games, but I saw a video on YouTube – one of the endings is like a dog, dog in a yep. control. Uh, actually, that's every Silent Hill game. <laughs> every Silent Hill game has a dog ending. Silent Why? Hill, I, I know. I, it, it's, it's the silly ending. Uh, Silent Hill 2 is the good one you want to play. Silent yeah. Hill 2 is the good this, one. This is, I'm, I'm going to pick this up. This is going to be my first Silent Hill experience. I think you'll really. 2 is very, very good. 3 is a. Three is a better game, but the story I, – I don't like the cult stuff. I, I, we're going to get real sidetracked, but just real quick. I don't like the cult stuff in Silent Hill. I really like the idea of Silent Hill being a very personal purgatory. I hate the cult storyline. I think it's stupid. I think it's silly. It's about witches and burning. You know, I Burn the witches! It's just – it's dumb. The Silent Hills that are about personal purgatory, and unfortunately everyone has done the exact same formula that was so fresh in two – Every Silent Hill game since that has done the same thing, and that's why they're all boring. That's why I have no real I've hope heard, for now. I've heard Shattered Memories is good. The the Wii and PSP. That's one. the ice one. That that's one. the ice one. That's I've the, heard. One. I've heard there's some phenomenal plot twist or something like that, and I've been meaning to play it for a long time. It's but my cool. Wii is in a closet. And I, I, whatever. I I mean, yeah. I'm not coming from a background with game. You know, doesn't matter to me. But anyways, let's. Yeah, let's continue move on. on with let's more move on news. And hope, let's move on and hope that downpour is good, but I don't think it will be. Oh, well. Um, so on to another big release this year. Skyrim uh, just had Skyrim. It's, it's Skyrim. Uh, Skyrim just had its DLC kind of detailed. At least uh, the first two packs, um, as far as they are planned, will be 360 exclusive for 30 days. Um, That's it? For thir- yeah, you know, it's that first month. It's not bad. It's certainly. I saw the boycott. No I saw the boycott Skyrim forums, and I was like, yeah, oh, they must have. They must already. have said the DLC was exclusive to somebody. Uh, such a bummer. Um, but yeah, so uh, and that that comes that news comes with a, a fresh set of, of screenshots uh, with uh, with a close look at the at different races and characters in the game. So definitely check that out. Did you see the uh, Did you see the thing where they were like, we have a new system for squashing bugs? And did you feel the internet roll its eyes? Hmm. I did. I didn't. I didn't see it, but I, I'm gonna be pretty. I well, I don't know. It's not. Who was it? It's not Obsidian. So. Uh, yeah, but. Uh... <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. I mean, it, it would. It's. It's not. Also, whatever silly engine that they were using for that. Yeah, it's a new stuff. engine. <laughs> Well, well, I suppose we will see when we get there. We'll be, uh, I just, we'll I see, be adults and withhold judgment. I know. I just might let Sky. I just might not play Skyrim for the first month. That's that's well, not you know, idea. You know, I, they, their games are buggy, but they're not broken. Like, yeah, that's true. Obsidian's games are broken. <laughs> Alpha Protocol was really good when it came out. Like I not buggy. Protocol. Really? Yeah, I, I, dude, yeah, I gave you that copy. You should. Yeah, really I know, it. Zach. I know. I just can't bring myself to play it. Yeah, I really want to hear what you have to say about that. Right? <laughs> I don't think there's enough coming rage. coming off of Deus Ex. I think that you'll probably very much dislike it. You'd be like, oh, what is this? There's a lot of things that they try that they kind of do similarly, and if you pretend that uh, Matt Thornton's superpowers, like his super spy powers, are augmentations, then I mean, his spy power to just stand perfectly still and, and be cloaked for some reason. Yeah, no, there's a whole lot of weird stuff going on in that game like very i don't know just pretend it's adam jensen except like the douchebag except that <laughs> except that matt thornton is is such a butt face and it's so awesome um anyways more news telltale uh our our recent you know the the people have been bringing us a, a lovely set of adventure games sorry Yep. Um, they are bringing Back to the Future, the game, uh, to the Wii and PlayStation 3. Um, and so I, at least on the Wii, it will be on sale this October uh, for a, a $20 bill. That will that will get you that game, uh, $19.99. Um, and uh, I think that 
what is it? Yeah, they're trying. They're trying to at least with uh, with Nintendo of America, they're trying to bring most of their back catalog, as far as I'm aware, or maybe not. I might have made that up. Um, I remember hearing about that. Or I don't know. They're they're bringing <laughs> things. Things are happening, but they. I think that they're mass they're, hysteria. Yeah. Um. From from here on out, I think that they're bringing almost all of their their games to the Wii and PS. At least PS3. I'm not sure about the Xbox. It, it, they only announced Wii and PS3 as of right you know, now. As far as I know, none of Telltale's games have been released on the Xbox. And I I know that there was recently that uh, Microsoft of Europe, one of their their uh, folks mm-hmm. uh, was that they wouldn't release arcade games that weren't first that that had to at least that's be such released. a poopy move of them that's so that's i just can't microsoft needs to get their head out of their butt sometimes speaking of poopy moves what oh yeah i was gonna save this for our last story but um, oh i'm sorry i'm sorry no, I didn't that's, mean cool. To that's cool no uh i guess now that we're on it uh gamestop as as some of you have no doubt heard uh, has pulled the surprise on live codes uh, from the PC copies of Deus Ex Human Revolution out of the boxes um, the, from which they came, and uh, there's been a big to do about it. So, so the gist of the story is that uh, Square Enix, without informing GameStop and without informing anyone else for that matter, uh, made a deal with On Live to package uh, their a, an on-live copy of Deus Ex Human Revolution with the uh, with your purchase of a retail PC copy of the game, at least in America. I'm not sure if that was the case in Europe. Um, and uh, GameStop found out about this, I guess, as soon as they got you know like their their copies of the game, uh, and it, I guess they hit the internet or whatever, and they started taking out these pieces of paper from the. Uh, from the box copies and the internet had a big to do and um, GameStop has since apologized and has said that they'll issue a $50 gift card to the people who purchased the game. Some GameSpot, uh, GameStops were even offering refunds for the game and letting you bring it back, which is funny because it's a Steamworks game and then you just have the game tied to your account anyways as long as you installed it or whatever. Um, <laughs> Wish Don't I do that, PC. kids. That's bad. I wish I bought um, that version. <laughs> yeah. Well, but, yeah, uh, they, they pulled the game now, so yeah. Now, now they have they have since pulled the game, so you know, like they're not they're not offering that anymore. Um, but yeah, they aside from the uh, the the gift card and the refunds, I think that they've they've still been very kind of you know like <laughs> oh like Square Enix didn't tell us and whatever. But um, the the uh, the kind of big news that this this brought out is that GameStop has since announced their own streaming service that will start uh, sometime next year, I believe, uh, and I, I imagine it'll be tied into to Impulse, uh, which is the the service that they bought from Stardock for for digital distribution. Um, and and honestly, all this really did was make me wish that Steam had a streaming service because I would be all over that. Um, well, I I think like that- I. See here, yeah. Why? Because don't you have a, a gaming quality PC, Zach? Like I do, but I really want a MacBook Air because those things are oh, tiny. And oh, you Apple, such and such, college student. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think that uh, just getting back to the main story. I think that uh, we, we talked a little bit pre-show. Both parties are in the wrong here. I think Square Enix, for them to put those on live uh, pieces of paper, to put those subscription things into the game and not tell GameStop was a bad move. I mean, GameStop has a right to know what they're selling. They have a right to know what's in the box. And so I think GameStop was well within their right to do something about it. What they did, however, (laughs) was not appropriate for them to take the games and go in and then take out things and then sell them. That's no, that, ain't yeah, that's, good. that's really, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of on the other end of the spectrum that like, you know, I, I suppose that square Enix should have said like, you know, like, Hey, we're gonna, you know, bundle a copy in with, with her game and blah, blah, blah. But, um, I just think it's kind of, you know, garbage of, of GameStop to do that. I think that, you know, like if I had bought a copy from GameStop, I would have like demanded a refund 
Um, you know, just because like, it's something that they are, you know, like they're selling. I mean, I guess, yeah, they should have like game, you know, Square Enix should have told them, but I don't know. I think GameStop is super in the wrong. And well, it's no, I think it's like, no difference than, than offering a Steam copy, like Portal 2, PlayStation 3 version, but, or like any we, Steamworks game. We, we had a little bit of discussion about this. Um, here, there's a big difference for GameStop selling a Steamwork game because even though that game gets tied to Steam and Steam is technically a competing service to Impulse, they're they're getting cash dollars selling you that Steamworks game, even though it's eventually going onto Steam. Mm-hmm. Now, selling a uh, a PC version of Portal with a PS3 version of the game, kind of a different story. I mean that. I don't know. Because it's a different platform, I see there as being a difference there. However, I do not agree with what GameStop did here. Total dick move. Like, I, you know, I'm, I'm a former GameStop employee. I know that they do the whole gut the game stuff, but this was a dick move 100%. It's not appropriate for them to do that. It's not appropriate for them to – I mean my copy of Shadow of the Colossus that I bought way back in 2005 was a new copy of Shadow of the Colossus. It was the last one in the store that they had gutted the game, mm-hmm. and they put the CD – they put the DVD into the game, and I just looked at the dude, and I'm just like, you know, really? This is not new. This is not sealed. Well, you, yelling you opened at Bert Rob. No, no, I didn't yell at him. I didn't yell at him because I know that that's their policy. So I didn't yell at him. But I'm sitting there in my head going like, that's horrible. Like, I just got a gutted game. I don't know. I just – I think that like – well, shoot. I was going to say something before that was really insightful and poignant. Um, the – the no, – no, I would never yell at an employee for that because uh, my my girlfriend she used to work for GameStop and she has told me some of the things that she was told to do and so I'm never going to yell at an employee for that. No, but some of their practices, you know, I don't think that the so-called boycott of GameStop is going to do anything over Deus Ex: Human Revolution, but I think it does show that. I think people are getting a little tired of it. I think people mm-hmm. are getting a little tired. I wasn't happy about the fact that I couldn't buy Twilight Princess the day it came out. I had to go to the Walmart two stores down to pick it up on my birthday, no less, because I didn't pre-order the game. Well, but you know, you also have to consider that Walmart is a store that can afford to lose money on their video games sure. because they're making significantly more money on you know, products that have a higher profit margin. GameStop now, and and I remember when Twilight Princess came out. I was working. Um, I think our store got two copies of it because we assumed that most of the copies that were going to be sold were for Wii, and they right. were. Right, you're right. No, you're right. It just it, there's some practices at GameStop that really bother me, and I think that they could do a lot to really enhance customer relations if they would change some things. And I, oh, I absolutely a lot of the a lot of the policies from corporate, I had significant issues. Like it, it sucks a lot of the time, and I, I can't disagree with that. Yep. All right, Zach's getting ready to go, so let's give him the last news story. Okay. So yeah. So uh, amid amid all of this news is uh, the the news that just came out of PAX East that Zeboid Games, creators of Breath of Death Seven and uh, Cthulhu Saves the World, uh, and the the wonderful, uh, rather long titled uh, bundle on Steam. Uh, is making the third episode of Penny Arcade Adventures on the Rain Precipice of Darkness, uh, which is something, it's something, I don't know, I think it's interesting because, I mean, it was canceled when uh, apparently Hothead didn't make enough money off of it or something like that. Um, And then I know Jerry Holkins, who is uh, the the Tycho of uh, Penny Arcade, for those of you who are unaware, uh, ended up writing out a prose version of the what would have been episode three if it had been created, so I'm I'm curious to see uh, how how that ends up happening. You know, like what it, you know whether it sticks to the to the prose version or if it kind of takes it in like a slightly new direction. If the mechanics stay the same, uh, I actually just bought during a recent Steam sale the the first two games for like a buck twenty five or something. Oh, I should have done. Um, and so yeah, so I'm I'm definitely going to check this out. Uh, apparently it's going to be a side-scrolling RPG released in 2012. Yeah, so, so, so I uh, this was brought to my attention. I was the one who wrote the news story that said it was mm-hmm. side-scrolling. Mm-hmm. Apparently it's going to be side-view battles. 
Oh, OK. Um, so that that little piece may not be true. I'm not 100 gotcha. percent sure. So we know that battles will be side view. Um, unfortunately, uh, we didn't have anyone at PAX this year to chat with uh, with Robert Boyden and, and uh, the other guys at Zaboid Games. So I can't get a 100 percent about that. But I, I may have side view side scrolling. I'm not sure what uh, what's going on there. Well, good for Zaboid Games. Uh, I think that they did a really good job with their last two releases, and I think it's really cool. I think I need to play the uh, Penny Arcade games. I've meant to do that for a while, and I just I never picked them up. So maybe next Steam sale, I'll have to pick them up. So mm -hmm. is that it for news? That is indeed it for news. All right, so Zach's got to get out of here. So uh, I'm going to let John, because we have a little something special at the end of the podcast. John, do you want to give a little introduction on that? Yeah, so... Um... We had a chance to speak with uh, Tobin Manthorpe from Cedar Hill Games. Uh, Tobin is the creator of Emissary of War. Um, and so for the first time, we're kind of going and we're saying, OK, let's chat with uh, with a developer. And it was just me and Tobin. And so it's about uh, 15 minutes long, maybe a little bit shorter than that. So I hope you enjoy that. And yeah, you'll be hearing that in just a moment. Yep, so uh, I thought John did a really good job on that. To other developers who are interested, we're definitely looking to talk to more people. I think Kim's trying to set something up this week. We won't say anything more than that. So, yeah, uh, let us know what you guys think of that, and hopefully maybe we can have some more developers on, and I'll have to be nice, hopefully. <laughs> I just, I'll just i never talk to the guys who made – God, what's a game I really hate? We'll never have David Cage on the show. <sighs> Ever. <laughs> I thought Kyle might come at me on that one. No? I think it's just nope. me and John. I think everyone's leaving. <laughs> Not going to respond. Okay, okay. I like stirring the pot. So, yeah, stay tuned for that interview if you guys are interested. Uh, for Zach, who had to leave early, uh, for John and Kyle, uh, this is Rob saying thank you very much for listening to Random Encounter. Be sure to subscribe to us on iTunes. Uh, give us reviews. Give us some feedback on the boards. Make sure uh, you guys let us know if you like what we're doing or if you can't stand us one way or the other. We're always looking to expand the show a little bit. And I think we have more games to talk about. I think probably maybe next time we talk we might have a little uh, Dead Island to talk about. We will see. So uh, thanks again for listening, guys. Talk to you all later. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Random Encounter, the RPG fan podcast. Uh, this is John McCarroll. I know that you're used to Rob giving this uh, introduction, but we're doing something a little bit different this time. Um, normally, our podcast, as you well know, is several of our staff members talking it out. Um, but I have today with me uh, Tobin Manthorpe from Cedar Hill Games, the developers of Emissary of War for iOS, uh, Tobin, please go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, hi, I'm Tobin, and uh, yeah, we've uh, we've just recently put out our game. Yeah, uh, the first chapter of Emissary of War is actually available for free on iOS, so please feel free to check it out. Uh, Tobin, do you mind telling us a little bit about the game? Sure. Yeah, um, Emissary of War is the story of a uh, of a barbarian, and someone has uh, decided that it's a good idea for him to go out and be an emissary for their uh, country. So uh, he goes out and he's um, shoring up treaties with uh, with uh, his home country's outlying territories. Um, he's got a uh, um, an, uh, an acquaintance and a, an accomplice, um, someone to help him back up, uh, back him up. It's uh, a guy called Hasek. He's an alchemist. And together, uh, the story starts with them almost at the end of their uh, their journey, their uh, um, their trip to uh, to get these uh, these uh, treaties signed. Rather excellent. Well, I had a chance to play the uh, the first chapter of the game actually earlier today, and uh, so I actually forgive me, I don't remember the the barbarian's name. Um, sure. Yeah, uh, his name is Ghent. Ghent. That's correct. Yeah. So. Um, you know, you tell, tell me a little bit about the Gant character. I mean, he seemed to be kind of very humor-oriented based on what I played. Is is that right? Yeah, well, he's um, Gant is a barbarian, so uh, but he's kind of tongue-in-cheek. Uh, um, he's, uh, he's a little bit dumb, but then he'll sort of 
do something that surprises you. I'm, I'm a big fan of um, uh, anime shows like Trigun and Cowboy Bebop, you know, where uh, someone, the, the, the main character at the beginning of the show does something really silly and uh, and you just can't believe how uh, how incredibly uh, useless he can be. And then by the end of the show, you're just in awe of how incredible he is. And... Um, and that's sort of what happens in the first level of the game, which if you if you download it, you'll see it's uh, he's he acts silly, but he he also sort of knows what he's doing as well. So uh, but uh, but some of the silly things he says are all based on the fact that he's not strictly an intelligent guy. Now, uh, for for our listeners who don't know, Tobin actually used to be was it an art director for for Bioware. Um, that was one of the jobs, but mainly I, I've been a, a level artist for, uh, um, Neverwinter Nights and Dragon Age. Those were my big jobs. Okay, gotcha. Did, did you have a chance to work on the Baldur's Gate franchise? Cause Gent reminds me a little bit of Minsk. Yeah. Um, I, I worked on, uh, Baldur's Gate one. I was an animator at the time. So, uh, I was in charge of rendering out all the. I think there were millions of uh, um, cells of character animation. Um, I did some of the character animations as well, and I worked on the um, the intro cutscene. But um, yeah, those those characters from from Baldur's Gate were were really excellent, and uh, and I admired them for sure. And I and we always knew, or the designers of Bioware always knew that uh, character development and character interaction was really important, and and that was the part that of. Uh, um, tabletop rpgs that the bioware always really tried to carry through so uh but yes i remember minsk and he was very funny and uh um again sort of had little quips and and things that he would say that that were very re- revealing of his character so well, excellent so um and in my little playthrough of emissary of war um brian one of our reviewers is going to be on the review um but i noticed that that as an iOS game, it's it's much more streamlined. You know, mm-hmm. th- there aren't a great deal of statistics, even though it is, you know, a kind of the quasi turn based. OK, select a guy to attack and he'll attack every turn. Uh, do you think that that when developing for iOS and for these mobile platforms that simple is better because it's easier to jump in and jump out? I think simplicity derives from the control system um, that the touch screen is is a brilliant way of interfacing with with games, but it doesn't work with all games. And and uh, and so you really have to be careful when you when you make a game that you don't that you don't make it too complicated. Um, uh, a lot of people I know and myself included, we're, we're not really fans of the uh, of the games that use D pads in the <laughs> bottom corner because um, on on touch devices, just because it's a very clumsy way of doing it. So um, we're we're definitely focusing on the control scheme, and and what that means is that there's only so many things you really want to clutter the screen up with. Um, now that that totally doesn't mean that that we're not interested in um, the the keystones of RPG, you know, the things that RPGs do really well, and uh, and in fact, really what what we've sort of stripped out in this game is um, is not necessarily what we wanted to strip out. It's just uh, we wanted to make sure that we finished a game and we made something that that people could could actually play and appreciate. We we would like to get it more into those uh, those regular RPG um, pillars. You know, things like inventory and uh, uh, a lot more character choices. We want to move into those things as soon as we can. Um, but yeah, the the game at the moment is 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 fairly light and it does suit the device and and I think it's still a really enjoyable game even oh. though we are missing some of those RPG things. Well, one thing that I thought worked really well is, is you have a party of two people and whereas a game like Chaos Rings which is a turn-based game but also has a party of two people falls to a more traditional system, essentially you you're setting Ghent onto a target and he's going to be attacking and then you have your alchemist as a support character and mainly you're issuing your orders to the alchemist but you're still having ghent do things and i thought that was that was a great way to kind of balance your party without making things too complicated yeah you, your, your time is definitely filled up you're you're watching what ghent's doing and you're you're hopefully not thinking too much about where hasik is because the ai has control of of his positioning um 
and you're just telling Hasek what you need in in your fight. Um, but sometimes that uh, you know you've got to watch that Hasek doesn't get attacked too much because he doesn't have as much uh, health as as your barbarian does. So uh, so you've got to make sure that you're protecting him as well. So. Um... Are you planning on expanding on Emissary of War and releasing more chapters as the game goes along? Yeah, we would love to. We, you know, we we're actually we started the game as just two people. We've got uh, I, I was the artist. I did all the art, and uh, I have a programmer who made that engine from scratch. And we've been doing that over the last year, year and a half. Um, but we really want to make it a bigger thing. We, In the last couple of months, we've got a designer in who's working part-time. He's got lots of experience with uh, games, mostly tabletop RPGs. Um, and uh, and he's got lots of great ideas about how he wants to improve gameplay and make it more involved. And um, and I've got lots of ideas about where I'd like to take the graphics. And, uh, you know, this is sort of... We definitely see this as a stepping stone, a way of... of uh, getting to something bigger and better. Absolutely. Now, um, obviously, Apple makes their new hardware every year, and they make things a little bit more powerful or a little bit more high resolution. Do, do you find difficulty there compared to, you know, you look at Nintendo or Sony's handhelds or the home consoles, um, and, you know, they have their static hardware. Is that more difficult to develop a game for hardware that's running the same OS but maybe different hardware? Um, we've never really had to deal with that, actually, because our, our engine, we, we started it, as I said, a year and a half ago, which in terms of iOS is an age. Um, so our, our game actually still runs on first generation iPhones and uh, iPod touches, which I think is brilliant. And it, I'm not sure how many people are going to be playing it on those devices, but um, uh we would probably do some catch up next time around because uh, as the screens get bigger, our characters look more blocky. But um, uh, we we would like to, you know, we, I, I think it's a really a testament to my programmer that we have the, all these skinned characters um, running around on uh, on first gen devices. And so, you know, when when Apple puts out its next device this year later maybe we'll uh, we'll see what they've got but I, I think we're gonna try and get up to the next version of uh, OpenGL OpenGL uh, 2 for our next game so that we can get some higher detail and I'm, I've got lots of experience with that because I worked on um, pipeline development and engine development at Bioware so uh, I know how to how to produce high, higher quality art so oh, that sounds good i uh, is the is emissary of war a universal ios app or is it an iphone specific app is there no ipad version no definitely the ipad version is there it's a universal oh. binary and uh um so yeah it's available for everything it, it obviously looks great on a on an iphone 4 and uh it plays really well on on the uh, ipad because your fingers don't get in the way as much um but i think that's true of most games and uh yeah, we're also we're also thinking about um, our Android build, which we've got going, and uh, we're thinking about you know what we might add to it based on comments that we've seen uh, on the internet. So okay, and Android, from from what I gather, is a much more difficult platform to develop for because you know it even compared to you know Apple has different versions of the iPhone, but there are so many different Android handsets out there. Mm -hmm. um, you, how, how do you see that? Yeah, we've we've already experienced this as a small developer. We only have so many bits of hardware we can test on, um, and the other problem is the uh, is the versioning of uh, of the OS is on uh, Android. A lot of uh, hardware producers, because they're in charge of of whether they upgrade or not to uh, to subsequent versions of uh, of Android. Uh, some of them are still, you know, lagging behind, and they're still on 2.2 or 2.1, and uh, it makes development difficult because because you have to try and get as far back down that uh, uh, OS tree as you can. Um, yeah, and, we, and we've we've had some devices that that uh, have had some problems with uh, um, later builds, but I think we're working through that, and uh, and it's it's looking really good. We've got it running on a lot of of devices, thanks to friends who have sort of let us try it out on their uh, on their machines. Well, that's good to hear. That's good to hear.
Was there anything else that you wanted to tell our listeners about to to get them to play Emissary of War? Yeah, well, it's uh, it's. I think what what I really want to focus on with my company, if if not just this game, is is that story is really important and characters are really important, and. Uh, uh, so in this game, there'll be twists and turns. Um, there'll be definitely character developments that you want to check out. And uh, and I think a lot of the buzz on the internet is that uh, is that you really get involved with these guys and their and what they're trying to do, and uh, and watch to the end because uh, we've got a funny little ending bit while the credits are playing. And it's uh, it's you know. Uh, I, I almost think of it in terms of tabletop uh, RPG, uh, like a sort of a one shot that you go to a uh, a convention and uh, and sit down for a little while and get a little shot of story. And uh, so, um, yeah, play it. It's a great game. Well, that sounds great. Well, Emissary at War is available now on iOS, and the first chapter is free. So go ahead and try it out. Thanks very much. Thank you, Tobin.